Everybody stand up on your feet and welcome Corey Russell. Come on up, Corey. Amen, amen. Grab a seat. <clears throat> yeah, it is. It was a tough one, but I'm glad to be with you guys. No, I, I love it. I love it here. I love being with you. I love just, uh, just what I feel when I come and connect with your hearts and uh, just feel the same thing with Lee. Um, yeah, I did. I brought my, my middle daughter with me, Maya, and uh, Maya's 16 years old. I have a 20-year-old daughter, 16-year-old daughter, and 9-year-old daughter, and so I'm surrounded with beautiful women, and uh, praise God, we got Maya. 2002, I love telling this, 2002, I got wrecked. Someone gave me a prophetic word that God was going to make me a watchman like Jeremiah. And so, you know, the only verse I knew was the plans I have for you verse. So, you know, the graduation card verse. It's a joke. I only got two more, so you need to laugh if you don't get it. <laughs> so I said, you know what, I need to check this book out. I wake up the next morning. It's sometime in 2002, and I wake up, and I begin to read the book of Jeremiah, and the from the, the, the moment I opened up the book, I began to weep uncontrollably. I had never had anything like it happen before or since, but for three days, as I read through the book, I was just weeping, 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 and the Lord really began to connect me to that we're in similar days as that of Jeremiah. And, and I came out of this encounter, and the Lord wrecked me with the gift of tears, some of the stuff I preached on last time. And I came out of this, and I go, honey, I looked at my wife, I go, we got to have a baby, and we're going to name him Jeremiah. <laughs> it don't work like that, but that's what I said. I said it by faith. And, um, and so we conceived not too long after and uh, had two ultrasounds. I'm going everywhere. We're having a boy. His name's Jeremiah, Jeremiah, Jeremiah. Two ultrasounds. Couldn't tell what he or she was. Jeremiah's coming. Jeremiah's coming. And on March 4, 2003, out comes a girl, and we knocked off Jera, and her name's Maya. <laughs> that spirit is on this girl, and God is anointing our sons and daughters with the prophetic spirit. She is an anointed worship leader, a woman of God, great compassion, and it's an honor to be with her. I'm, I'm grateful for all our kids, but boy, you know, I just love being with Maya. She just brings oil to my heart. Who's grateful for the kids that just bring oil to your heart, huh? <laughs> anyway. All right, turn to Revelation 22. We're going to start there. We'll see where we go. It's an honor to be with you. I, I just, you guys are my heroes. We're doing it in Dallas. I'm running into different churches that are taking the first 21 days of the year or taking the first season of the year and just setting it apart for prayer and fasting. And I think it's a beautiful way to set the uh, rhythm for the year, and in this case, for the decade. As we move into a different decade and as we position ourselves, and I really believe that we have crossed over into a, a new period. Some of the words that the Lord whispered to me as I was asking him what he had for 2020 and on, he was whispering phrases like, it's time to run. It's time to run, and I, I, I could feel the Holy Spirit breathing and whispering to me saying, Corey, I want to dream with you, and I want to run together in this next season. There are seasons of being drawn away, and there are seasons of running. And I really feel like the body of Christ is going to begin to run with Jesus in some amazing things. I also feel that the Lord was telling me, last time I was with you in September, I preached on the gift of tears. And I feel like we're still, many of us, as we cross over to this decade, there's still much of that that's going on. But I'm also hearing the Holy Spirit say, he's turning our water into wine. He's turning our water into wine. The bottles that have been filled with our tears are being turned into the wine of the Holy Spirit. And I believe great joy, great uh, uh, life, and great harvest. Those who sow in tears will reap in joy. And I believe it's coming to the body of Christ. I believe he's training the body of Christ of learning how to come out of storms and learn how to rest in Christ and not get moved anymore by the storms. I believe in Matthew 8, in the same way Jesus was asleep in the middle of the storm, so he's inviting the body of Christ to learn how to sleep in the middle of the storm. That's good, Corey. 
I thought so too. But I want to look at Revelation 22. Did you know there's 22 chapters in Revelation? And do you know the last book of the Bible is not called the Revelation of Satan? It's not called the Revelation of the Antichrist. It's not called the Revelation of seals, trumpets, and bowls. It's the Revelation of Jesus Christ. It's the unveiling and the unfolding of the beauty of this man and his leadership as he establishes his kingdom on this earth. It's a beautiful hour, and I believe that we're living in a very significant hour of human history, and I can feel the pace in the spirit picking up. I can feel the intentionality of God picking up, and whatever he's doing, it's taking us to Revelation 22, 17. That's the verse I want to look at. Many of us will hear it in our worship songs, but it's so profound. Let's look at this. Revelation 22, 17. And the spirit and the bride say, come. Let him who hears come. Let him who thirsts come. Keep it there. Whoever desires, take the water for us for you. <laughs> I want everybody to repeat after me. Say, the spirit and the bride say, come. Now again, say, the spirit and the bride say, come. That is a threefold prophecy of where we're going in the coming days. I believe that God producing these three realities in the church is going to become paramount as we approach the second coming of Jesus. Do you know why Jesus is coming back? It's because we want him to. And do you know why we're gonna want him to? Because the revelation of Jesus is about to fill the church like no other time in human history. The veil, what uh, Pastor Lee was just praying into, the knowledge of God, the revelation of the holy, the funk is being knocked off the church, and the church is coming into the revelation of how heaven sees Jesus, values Jesus, and esteems Jesus, and the church is coming into the revelation of Jesus. And when you see him, you're going to long for him. In that verse, we see three things. Number one, we see that the days are coming when the Holy Spirit and the church are going to come into unity with one another. For the last 2,000 years, Holy Spirit's been on FM while we've been on AM. But before he returns, this is Jesus' prayer in John 17. He wasn't just praying for more potluck dinners. Do that. That's awesome. I need somebody to have a potluck because your meal's probably better than mine. But Jesus isn't praying for just some horizontal, let's bury the hatchet and try to connect. What Jesus is praying for, he says things like, Father, I want them to be one in us. As you're in me and I'm in you, that they would be one in us, that an unbelieving world would believe that you sent me. John 17, 22, he says, the glory you've given me, I've given them that they may be one just as we are one. It's going to take glory to get us where we got to get. John 17, 24, he says, Father, I desire that those whom you've given me, that they would be with me where I am and that they would behold my glory. Do you know that Jesus gets his prayers answered? And the Father is going to answer Jesus' prayer by bringing the church into a divine unity with the Holy Spirit. I'm going to come back to that point. Number two, the church is going to begin to operate in a bridal identity. The revelation of God as Father and the revelation of God as Bridegroom is going to fill the church and we're going to come out of orphanhood and we're going to come out of widowhood, and we're going to come into a divine partnership and intimacy with the Son of God. The dirty garments are coming off the church. The dirty garments of performance-based religion, works-based religion, shame-based religion is breaking off the church, and the revelation of our righteousness in Christ, and the revelation of being cherished and longed for and being desired by our beloved bridegroom king is going to fill the church as we throw off dirty garments and we put on our beautiful garments and we begin to shine. Yeah. 
What's going to happen when the nitrogen of the spirit meets, meets the glycerin of a bridal identity? What's going to happen when the nitrogen of Holy Ghost meets a church that's confident in love? A global kaboom is going to be released across the globe. It's called the cry, come. Come, I call it the breakthrough prayer. It's the breakthrough prayer that penetrates through the fog and the noise, but where our deep calls out to his deep, and we pull on the Son of God to say, God, come to me in intimacy. Come near me in revival, and come for me at your coming. But my question, and the thing that's hitting me is, I think it's important that it's one of the last verses of our Bible, which means it took all of redemptive history and it took all of the book of Revelation to get the church here. God has two great ingredients to get us where we gotta get. Number one, he's going to release great presence. I'm here to tell you that the church is being prepared. I believe Radiant is one of those apostolic hubs that's called to be a wineskin to contain the new wine of what God wants to release in the earth. You're just at the beginning of this. There is new wineskins. Matthew 9 is screaming in my spirit. Jesus is saying you will, he will not put new wine into old wineskins. And so he's building apostolic structures that can contain the fullness of what he wants to release. Friend, I want you to get ready for a deluge of the Holy Spirit. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit filling our homes, filling our church, filling our neighborhoods. The glory of God, the effortless glory of God. Effortless healing, deliverance, salvation in the manifest glory. And God's going to fill the whole earth with his glory. God's going to use great presence and God's going to use great pressure. Many of us just want the presence, but presence and pressure go hand in hand. Not only because we just think book of Acts happened, day of Pentecost happens, it's glory, glory, hallelujah. No, when glory starts coming, people can't lie on their taxes anymore. People can't lie about how much they kept. You can't get away with the stuff you used to in a previous season because God's gotten closer. And when his presence and pressure, because I, I want to make something clear to you, global pressure is coming. It's at the beginning right now, but it's only going to intensify as God shakes the nations and shakes everything that can be shaken so that a church would come out of compromise, apathy, lethargy, other lovers, and that we would come into unity with Jesus. Great presence and great pressure will produce a great prayer. Think about God's ingredients in your life. I mean, God pretty much has two ingredients. He blows you up, you get wrecked in the glory, wrecked, I could sing of your love forever. We get rocked, we lay on our back for four days, and then we go home, and we gotta deal with issues at home. We gotta deal with issues in our finances, issues at work. Issues in this situation. Issues in this situation. And God uses two realities, the glory and the gory, to deliver us from independence and isolation. I believe with all my heart, God is bringing the church to a place of deliverance from our own wisdom our own ability, our own ingenuity, our own gift mix, and us just being able to do stuff in our own strength because God is bringing the church into a context to bring the church and deliver us from us and drive us into a deeper dependence on the Holy Spirit. Everybody say Holy Spirit. Say Holy Spirit. Say it one more time. For a season, I don't want you to call him the... I don't want you to call him the Holy Spirit. Friend, I want you to know that we are dealing with the third person of the Trinity. He's as much God as the Father is God and as Jesus is God. And the Holy Spirit's favorite occupation is to take us on a guided tour into the revelation of Jesus. 
I believe with all my heart that a greater intimacy with him is coming forth. Put your hand on your belly. Everybody say, good evening, Holy Spirit. Why do I have my hand on my belly? Because Jesus says out of your belly will flow rivers. Friend, do you know the Holy Spirit? Are you intimate with him? Do you talk to him? Do you commune with him? Do you feel him talk to you in your emotions? Do you hear him talk to you in your thoughts? Does he cause Bible verses to jump off the page to you? I believe with all my heart, the church is coming out of doing this thing in our own ability, and he's bringing us into greater dependence. Holy Spirit's coming out of the closet and he's about to take over as he begins to get up into our business. And he begins to confront the stuff religion would never touch. Do you know religion will let you have plastic smiles and praise the Lord, bumper stickers and Christianity shirts, and have a real nice life, but yet be filled with jealousy and envy and lust, comparison, anger, rejection, shame, fear, be bound up on the inside. And as we cry out saying, Holy Spirit, we want to come into a greater intimacy with you. I believe that the baptism of fire is coming and he's going to begin to clean out his threshing floor, which is our hearts to prepare for us to come into unity with him. Oh, we're going to come into a unity with the Holy Spirit. But do you know that you only unify with that which you submit to? Unity is the byproduct of mutual submission. And as we learn to submit to the Holy Spirit, because there's usually about one to two to three things that Holy Spirit is putting his finger on in your life as you come out of this season of fasting. Holy Spirit saying, I want more attention from you. I want you to turn ESPN off more this year. I want you to come out of the political swirl more this year than you did last year because it's getting more toxic. And for your soul, that's what it looks like. He will put his finger on stuff, and I want to tell you and I want to plead with you, give way to the Holy Spirit. Hear his whispers. Turn off the other voices and begin to say, God, I want to know you more in 2020, Holy Spirit, than I've ever known you before. Oh, I want to know the Holy Spirit. I want to be intimate with him. We can talk about Jesus because for mo most of our mindsets in the Gospels, you can define him. He's manageable in our terms, though he's not but he can fit into our constructs. We can talk about the Father because he's like Jesus, and Jesus came to reveal him. But when you start talking about Holy Spirit, what's he going to do? How's he going to come? Am I going to shake? Are tongues going to come out of me? Is he going to embarrass me? Are things going to happen? What will Holy Spirit do? We don't exactly know. I believe Holy Spirit's coming into the church to deliver us from control, to deliver us from self-respect as we know it, and he is going to begin to carve out new space on the inside of us. <laughs> Jesus. Everybody take a deep breath. We just had Christmas. Do you have that weird uncle at Christmas? Anybody got that weird, maybe he's drunk uncle at Christmas. Anybody used to be the drunk uncle at Christmas? <laughs> Anybody is the drunk uncle. You're working it out. <laughs> yeah, okay. We're all working it out. <laughs> Everybody wants the perfect Instagram picture Christmas. Let's just bury our hatchets, let's put on fake smiles, don't bring up the weird, controversial stuff, and let's just get along until that uncle comes out of the back room and he begins to stir up every elephant in the family. He'll talk about mom's issue with son, daughter-in-law's issue with mother-in-law, 
sister-in-law's issue with sister, and you begin to see a stirring up of Christmas as the uncle stirs the nest. I believe Holy Spirit is coming out and he's delivering the church from nice, polished, Instagram-worthy pictures, and he's beginning to bring us into a deeper place of honesty, purity, and authenticity in the core of our being. Understand, as he gets closer, he's going to touch the stuff religion let you live with for 30 years. He will get up into your business. He will put his finger on stuff. He will stir up stuff. He'll touch pockets of shame, pockets of rejection, pockets of fear that led to other cycles. And he is going to begin to say, just come to me. Come to me. Submit to me and watch me prepare a glory place for you on the inside of me. Matthew 3.11. I love John the Baptist. John the Baptist's favorite title of Jesus was Jesus the Baptist. The one who will baptize you. Can you put up Matthew 3.11 up here? I love John. They are all looking at him. Who are you? What you got? He goes, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I. I love that. Keep going. Whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. Wow. Him? I can clean the outside of your dish, outside of the temple, and get you ready in repentance to receive him. But him, he's coming with fire. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Which means he's about to get up into your business. Look at the next verse, verse 12. He says this. He says, his winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor. Friends, I want to tell you the baptism of fire is coming to the church. The refiner is coming, and he's coming to purify the sons of Levi so we may offer to him an offering in righteousness. Who wants the fire? Yeah, I appreciate two hands raised. Because the rest of you are really counting the cost. I don't know. I do, but I don't. I believe we're getting prepared for great glory. Can you put Luke 12, 49 up here? Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. I love all the ways Jesus came. We know Jesus came to bring peace. He came to seek and save the lost. He came to lay down his life and give it as a ransom for many. But Luke 12, 49, how about this face of Jesus? How about this mission statement for Jesus? I came to send fire on the earth. And how I wish this party was already started. Jesus wasn't running from the cross. We see six months outside of Calvary, there was this deep longing inside of Jesus to get closer to us. He hated the distance, he hated the blocks, and he longed to get closer on the inside of us. And I can feel his longing right here. Look at this next verse, keep going with me. I came to send fire on the earth. Next verse. Verse 50. I have a baptism to be baptized with and how distressed I am till it is accomplished. Jesus wasn't running from the cross. Jesus was running through the cross. How distressed I am till it's accomplished. Verse 51. He says, do you suppose that I came to give peace on the earth? Yes, Jesus. You want us all to be happy. You want to make it as least controversial as you can. You just want us to get along and bury the embarrassing stuff. Do you think I came to bring peace on the earth? Yes, Jesus. I tell you, not at all. But rather, division. Who's talking about the Jesus that brings division? 
so that he can have peace on his terms. And then he's going to talk about Christmas dinner. Verse 52, for, for, there, from now on, five and one house will be divided. Three against two, two against three. Father against son, son against father, mother against daughter, daughter against mother. Daughter-in-law, mother-in-law, mother-in-law, daughter-in-law. <laughs> what is Jesus saying? He's saying, I will get up into the middle of the most intimate of family relationships to have you for myself and for a season there will be division but I will bring it back around for unity on my terms. <laughs> Understand that as the fire gets closer to you it will begin to separate you from what you've been used to and ran in the last season. It will get up in the middle of stuff and it will create strife and create tension and create awkwardness and create tensions on the inside of you as your old friends want you to be the old you and yet you're feeling God calling you into a new you. And the people that you've spent every day with in the last decade, they're going to have to move to a once a month coffee as you begin to move into a different direction. The fire of the Holy Spirit's coming. The fire of the Holy Spirit's coming. This is what the fire of the Holy Spirit does. It burns up the chaff and the, de the wrong views of God that have kept us at a distance. I believe with all my heart, he is releasing the revelation of sonship and he's releasing the revelation of bridal identity. The church has been living in the front yard of works-based religion way too long. We've been living in the front yard of working for God. And I believe that the Father is calling the church into the house of learning how to abide as sons. Live in the house of acceptance. Live in the house of enjoyment. Live in the house of belonging. And living in the house of inheritance. He's breaking orphanhood. He's breaking widowhood. He's breaking works-based, performance-based. And he's bringing us into partnership with him. That's what the fire of the Holy Spirit's doing. It's burning up the chaff. All the wrong views. It's called idolatry. Entertainment of thoughts about God that are unworthy of him. Entertainment of thoughts about God that are unworthy of him. Friends, I want you to know that we've bought into so many lies and have truths about our Father and about our Bridegroom King, and we've bought into so many lies, and we've related to God through our jacked-up lens, and I believe with all my heart, He's releasing the fire to burn up that chaff, and He's releasing the cleansing water of the Word to knock off the bird crap, off the window shields of our theologies, so we can begin to see God rightly. Did he say bird crap? Yes, I did. <laughs> Y'all ever have those birds around here that just diarrhea all over your windows? I believe that's the devil's full-time job. Lies and half-truths and perversions about our Father, and we view God through that lens. And I believe he's cleansing the body. He's washing us with the washing of the water by the word. Are y'all okay tonight? The revelation, his tenderness is coming back to the church. He's knocking off hardness. He's knocking off jadedness. He's knocking off indifference, and we're going to get tender again, friends. We're going to feel again. I talked about the gift of tears. He's breaking up that fallow ground, and we're going to start feeling and sensing his tenderness and his kindness and relating with him through the lens of mercy. Holy Spirit's going to reveal him in the deepest parts of us. He's going to bring us into this bridal identity and the anointing of prayer. Is coming on the church. The anointing of the spirit of prayer is coming on the church. Friend, I, I want you to know, I want you to begin to ask God. Prayer isn't for the select few. The one thing the disciples asked Jesus to teach them in was prayer. 
what would it have looked like to watch Jesus pray? And I believe that he's going to help us. Can you put Romans 8.26 up here? The Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. We do not know what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Keep going. He says this. He says that, verse 27, something. He searches the hearts, knows what the mind of the Spirit is. He makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Holy Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. Holy Spirit burns up the chaff. Holy Spirit releases new garments to us. And the Holy Spirit teaches us how to pray. Because we don't know how to pray as we ought. But Holy Spirit helps us. Put your hand on your belly again. I want you to get connected. I'm not playing. Do you know the Holy Spirit? Quit trying harder and look at him more. Quit trying harder and look at him more. That's your homework assignment for 2020. Talk to the Holy Spirit more. Commune with the Holy Spirit. Give, give conscious awareness to his presence within you. You have the Shekinah flame dwelling in your spirit. Do you know that? Do you know the greatest miracle that took place when you were born again is that God took of his very own substance, his very own nature, and infused it into your dead spirit, and you have now become the habitation of the living God. You got that one down? Christ in you, the hope of glory. You need to thank God you did not blow up in your sleep last night. You need to thank God there's not smoke coming out of your ears right now. That God has actually built a structure, your body, that doesn't explode with him coming into it. And that you don't immediately die when you sin. Do we have any clue what it costs God to dwell on the inside of us? Every one of us in this room have a trillion dollars dwelling in your spirit. Treasure in earthen vessels. Riches of his glory. But 99.8% of us in this room live on 20 cents a day. And Jesus is Jewish. Which means he's a shrewd businessman. And he does not make trillion dollar investments for 20 cent returns. What more can he do than come and live on the inside of you and give you everything that pertains to life and godliness? The flame of God lives on the inside of you and you're going to try a little harder. You're going to try to be better this year. Stop it. Stop it. Put your hand on your belly because God has given you the greatest gift and his name is helper. Everybody say helper. You know why he sent you a helper? Because you need help. I'm looking at you. You need help. You're not that smart. You're not that gifted. You ain't got a lot going for you. Outside of the most glorious person who has chosen to make you his residence. And the flame of God is living on the inside of you. You have all wisdom, all power, all goodness, all love, all patience, all might dwelling on the inside of you. And we're living on 20 cents a day. We're professional ATM dancers. I got the glory. I got the glory. I got the glory. I got the glory. We can dance around ATMs all day. We got to learn how to make withdrawals. You don't know what I'm talking about. 
How do we begin to lay hold of the life of God within us? Meditation in the Word of God. Quit trying to read your Bible in a year and slow down. And when words jump off the page, whisper them back to Jesus. Listen, don't just clap it. Do it. Do it. Take phrases that jump off the page. None of us have this thing down. We're all two-year-olds trying to focus. We're all two-year-olds trying our best to figure out there's nobody that's got it. Don't let me fool you, leave fool you, anybody fool you. We're all trying to find our way. And I just want to tell you in the awkwardness of you in a Bible alone with God, when a word jumps off, say it back to him. And just say, God, what's this mean? I don't understand. What did you feel when you looked at them and had compassion? What does Jesus having compassion look like? That's called meditation. And as you do that, Holy Spirit gets stirred because Holy Spirit's favorite chariot to ride in is the Word of God. When Holy Spirit hears Bible, he gets stirred up. The words I speak to you are spirit. That's how you access the life of God. Number two, talk to the Holy Spirit. Here's your homework assignment. If it's in your bedroom, in your closet, in your commute to work, put your hand on your belly, turn off politics. Turn off ESPN. Turn off the noise of this culture. Distance yourself from the other voices and begin to talk to him and say, Holy Spirit, thank you. Thank you that you've made me your home. I was once your enemy and now I'm your home. I have everything that's re pertaining to life and godliness. I'm not alone. Some of you deal with chronic loneliness and rejection. The indwelling spirit Breaks the power of rejection. Breaks the power of loneliness. Breaks the power of isolation. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Reign in me, Holy Spirit. Reign over my thought life. Reign over my emotions. Reign over my desires. Romans 8 says these are the sons of God, not those who are led by the current struggle they're facing. These are the sons of God, those who are led by the Spirit. Most of us are led by our souls. Our circumstances, our struggles, our victories. We get really high when it's good, really low when it's bad. And yet I want to say there's a higher way to put the Spirit of God in the front seat and get your soul in the back seat and say, I'm going to live submitted underneath the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Use me, Holy Spirit. May my smile break depression off the bank clerk. May my smile break the funk off of the grocery store clerk. Strengthen me, Holy Spirit. Strengthen me, Holy Spirit. Say it to him right now. Say, strengthen me, Holy Spirit. I didn't know I could talk to the Holy Spirit. He's God. <laughs> talk to him. Talk to him. Teach me, Holy Spirit. I don't know much. Teach me, Holy Spirit. Some of you need some of you will get divine ideas in business. Teach me, Holy Spirit. There's inventions. There's inventions that Holy Spirit's waiting on you to ask him for. Hallelujah. Can you feel him rising in the room? Can you feel your John the Baptist starting to jump in here? What's he talking about? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I tell you, I feel so good right now. All week long, I've been, this is my fifth message, and it's Wednesday this week. 
And I come into this and I'm saying, God, I love you. I feel alive on the inside. I feel divine might coursing through my veins. You know why? I asked him. <laughs> I asked him. Do you know one of the greatest signs of our pride and arrogance? Our inability to ask God to help. Ask him to help you. His name is Helper. Meditation in the Bible. Fellowshipping with the Holy Spirit. Communing with him. And number three, praying in the Holy Spirit. Praying in the Holy Spirit. And there are many ways in which we pray in the Holy Spirit. I believe that Bible verses that we pray back to God are prayers in the Spirit. God ordained prayers are prayers in the Spirit. Apostolic prayers are prayers in the Spirit. Our tears are praying in the Spirit. Our groan songs are prayers in the Spirit. But I want to give you a vision for that personal devotional prayer language that you begin to activate in your personal life between you and God. And you begin to lay hold of it. And it not just be a badge that you got one time at youth camp, but that it's something that you employ to open up the gates of heaven in your life. Oh, friend, I want you to know God wants to begin to release a holy buzz on the inside of you. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 14, 18. Think about how bold you have to be. Show up, stare everybody down and go, I thank God I speak with tongues more than all of y'all jokers. That's a bold dude. He says that when a man speaks in tongues, he doesn't speak to men, but he speaks to God. And he speaks mysteries. Everybody say mysteries. There is a realm of revelation that's waiting for you. There are divine thoughts, divine emotions, divine power that's waiting for you. Hallelujah. Do you pray in the Holy Spirit? Some of you have never received your prayer language. Praise God, tonight's your lucky night. For the rest of you, we're going to rip our badge off and we're going to start doing it. I don't care if you got it. My question is, does it got you? Does it got you? I want car rides to be filled with holy communion with the Holy Ghost. Fellowshipping with the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. That's weird. It's all weird. <laughs> it's all weird. You ain't got to be weird. But what, I mean, we're talking about crazy stuff in the Word of God. <laughs> Holy Spirit. See, I believe when we talk up, so when Revelation twenty two seventeen 17, for the Spirit and the bride say come, I believe it's imperative that we begin to turn inward. Now, follow me here. We're always hearing about turning outward to others. I believe our ability to impact people outside is connected to our connection to him who is on the inside. And your ability to go wide is connected to your ability to go deep. Christianity is giving fresh witness of someone you've seen and heard recently. God wants to release Recent encounters, recent oil, recent fire, recent joy, and lay hold of you. Hallelujah. He says that when a man speaks in tongues, he edifies himself. It's called spiritual weightlifting. Do you know you can have this thing looking like the rock in the spirit? I'm serious. It's resistance that produces strength. But can I be honest with you? And I'm just, I got five minutes. Listen, when I pray for people, and I, the majority of people that I'm seeing in the body of Christ, they have uncultivated spirits. They have not cultivated their interior life. I am calling all of us to focus, focus on the indwelling spirit this year. Can you put Jeremiah 12, 5? I believe this is a word he's whispering to me right now. Jeremiah says, if you've run with the footmen and they wore you out, how can you contend with horses? 
And if in the land of peace in which you trusted, they wearied you, how will you do in the floodplain of the Jordan? I believe God's saying, if you're worn out on 2019, get ready for what's coming in 2020. And if you couldn't make it at a 2.0 on the treadmill of Christianity, understand an 8.0 is coming upon the earth. And if you do not begin to shift and get delivered from doing this thing in your own strength and your own ability, you will not survive the next season of coming glory and shaking that's coming upon the earth. I believe it's time for boot camp in the spirit. And I believe he wants to call us into a new place of this like never before. Amen? Amen. Let's stand. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, I love you. Holy Spirit, I honor you. I bless you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm going to ask something right now. Who in here would like to receive your prayer language tonight? Raise your hand. Praise God. Good. If you've raised your hand, now we're going to do the evangelist thing. Now come on up here. Come on up here if you raised your hand. You're like, I've been to a thousand altar calls. I don't care. Good. Come on, Z. Hallelujah. Come to the waters, you who are thirsty. Come to the waters, you who are thirsty. Come to the waters, you who are thirsty. <sighs> Praise God. Push on in. Push on in. We got several people. Just come all the way to the front here. Good. Now, for the rest of us in the back, I want you to lift your right hand like this. Put it on your chest like that. Do it like that. Do it like that. You just threw your tongues badge in the trash. See, this is the greatest hindrance we've done to it because we've made it about, I got that. I've arrived. There's nothing left to discover. I got all my Pentecostal, all my charismatic dots, I's dotted and T's crossed. I'm in. That's the spirit of religion. The spirit of religion is simply this. I've arrived. The spirit of revelation shows you that you're in a paddle boat and he's the Pacific Ocean. He was talking about the holy holy tonight. I believe that the greatest crisis confronting the church in America is the cancer of boredom in the church. We are bored and we are boring because we've arrived. And we, we need an all shaking, fascinating revelation of Jesus Christ that knocks us off our horses, that blows our mind and leaves us like Ezekiel by the river Kabar, seven days astonished. Hallelujah. I love this. This is beautiful. We're going to ask him to fill all of us. And the rest of you, I'm looking at some of y'all in the back. Y'all need it too. So y'all might have had some at youth camp, but you need some in 2020. See, that's the thing with Ephesians 5. It says, go on being filled with the Spirit. Go on being filled with the Spirit. Don't get drunk with wine. Get filled. And keep on getting filled. Keep on getting filled. Keep on getting filled. So we're going to ask him, open up your hands like this. We're all going to pray together, and this is how it's going to work. He's a good father. None of you are going to work for this. Can everybody take a deep breath? That's how you receive. If you can breathe, you can receive. If you can breathe, you can receive. You're not going to earn this. You're not going to work for this. It's a free gift, and it's Christmas. You're going to breathe and receive. Hallelujah. He's a good father. And he will begin to well up within your belly. 
You will feel that John 4, even right now some of you are feeling it, John 4 springing up into everlasting life. That John 7 river breaking out of your innermost being. That's God's part is the springing. Your part is to step out of the boat and for one moment you may look like an idiot but that's when the that's when the water flows hallelujah so let's ask him all together right now look at abba luke 11 if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children how much more will your heavenly father give the holy spirit to those who ask him he's a good father He's a good father. If you ask for bread, he won't give you a stone. Bring it down. I want you to hear your voices right now. Everybody repeat after me. Just say, Father, Abba, I love you. You love me. I'm your favorite. I really am your favorite. I ask you right now to baptize me with the Holy Ghost and fire. I want to speak in tongues. I want to prophesy. I want everything you died for. So in the name of Jesus, baptize me. Fill me. Take over my life. I need you, Holy Spirit. Come, I receive in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now receive the Holy Spirit right now. You in the back, I want you to lift your voices. I want to hear your voices. And as you feel that welling up within you, just begin to pray in the Holy Ghost right now. Hallelujah. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Be filled with the I want to hear your voices in the back. 